Okay. So thank you to the listeners for joining us in this careers conversation. Today we're in conversation with Charlotte Kingston, who currently works as the head of interpretation and design at National Railway Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today, Charlotte, and for taking the time to share with us some of your advice and your insights from your rich background of experience in the creative world. Going right from television and radio research through to work on a huge variety of museum and heritage projects, including curatorial development, interpretive planning, and capital projects as well. We're really looking forward to hearing about your path and to hearing your advice and tips for those thinking of working in this sector. So going right back, after graduating from Cambridge with an English degree and then an MA from the Courtauld in History of Art, and then Yale in medieval studies and English literature, you started then working in radio and television research, including for In Our Time on BBC. So how did you manage to secure these roles early on? Uh, really good question. Thank you for having me today. It's really nice to be speaking to you. Um, the, uh, the first, so I realised during the course of my uh, degree at Yale um, that I was really interested in kind of how I could use some of the work I was working on to tell bigger stories to more people effectively. Um, and that was part of my transition really away from academia was thinking about reaching wider audiences. So I made a couple of things there. I did, a, instead of a final paper, I made a website, which was quite interesting, um, sort of back in 2011. So it was all quite difficult to do that um, in partnership with the manuscripts library there. Um, and I also made radio programmes when I was there as well. I basically turned yeah. up at the local radio station, something I'd wanted to do, student radio, and hadn't got the opportunity until I went to America and, and then did it there. Um, so in my summers uh, throughout um, my graduate school, I started kind of uh, freelancing and volunteering, really, um, wherever I could find an opportunity. Um, obviously, the BBC makes its own programmes, but a lot of people make programmes for the BBC as independent companies. So I managed to find some contacts with um, some of those companies companies and basically uh, did work experience with them and then eventually got a very low paid but some paid contract work um, as researchers kind of doing that. Um, the BBC, my, my sort of enter, entry into the BBC was, was really a bit of luck because I did apply for the BBC graduate scheme which I don't know if it's still running now um, but got nowhere with that so um, I went to other routes and I contacted people I might know who worked there, uh, producers of, of, of programmes and sort of asked them if they did any um, ad hoc work experience um, and that was what gave me six weeks with the World Service on a programme called The Forum and I think it helped that I wasn't picky about which programme I'd be working on um, so I did that one summer, it was unpaid um, and it was uh, so I was lucky to be able to, to, to do that um, and the, uh, the the killer thing that I think I, I managed to nail was at the end of those six weeks I said great I've given you my time for six weeks and I've learned a lot could you set up some introductions for me and that was how I got introduced to In Our Time so I went to In Our Time and I went to Woman's Hour and I attended their planning meetings for both of them. And that was my opportunity. Um, I suppose the big thing that I did there also was I took ideas with me. I took multiple ideas with me for long term pro project programs ideas. But also I brought I'd happened to have interviewed somebody really recently who was a female racing driver and Women's Hour needed somebody who fit roughly that description. So I gave them her contact details with her permission, obviously. So I was able to, in a very, very small way, add something to that meeting, even though I was only there for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Um, and as a result of the In Our Time uh, meeting, I was able to secure some ongoing freelance work, which I then did for the next two years, just interviewing their, their, um, their interviewees and, and preparing papers for, for their researchers, basically. Oh, really interesting. So really reaching out and being open. That's um, and do you think that you had a plan early on for what you wanted to achieve? <laughs> uh, many plans. <laughs> um, I don't think I ever, I really enjoyed radio because I was really inspired by some of the American radio programs that I was listening to. I was an early listener to This American Life. Mm -hmm. I um, ha have always really enjoyed soundscapes and listening to uh, audio, audio books, audio trails. Now it seems like it's, it's, it's everybody's listening to the latest podcast. But I think back in 2010, that wasn't really happening. But I was making podcasts and I was kind of having a go to see whether this was something I, I would enjoy. And I really enjoyed the audio editing as well. And I'd, I come from a musical background as well. I've got so I like I like listening um, but really I wasn't very fussy I kind of um, I, I was interested in what jobs could could offer me in terms of 
were they creative were they working with other people did they have an audience um so i sort of spread my net pretty wide and actually once i decided that actually i didn't quite have the contacts to be able to make an, make a living out of freelance work on the radio and tv side of things i spread my net very wide and went for a whole range of jobs in publishing to museums to um, marketing to comms and applied for, for as many things as i could find and um, at the end of that got a job with, with with a festival and then moved on from that into museum planning and so had you thought at some point through that, that you might stay in academia for a PhD? Yes, I had. <laughs> um, I don't think you do three MA, well, two yeah. MAs in a, in a, in a oh, Cambridge well. undergrad. <laughs> I don't think you do that and not think, ah, oh, yes, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be a professor, I'm going to do this. Um, ultimately, it came down to personal preference. I was really homesick when I was in the States and I wanted to come home. And I was aware that if I did the American PhD system, which seemed to my view, um, they're, both, they're both valid, but it seemed like that gave you the better kind of teaching and sort of professional setup that you might need. And I had the opportunity to go for that. So that's what I was considering. And I just realized I didn't want to be shipped off to a college in the middle of Ohio. I'm sure the middle of Ohio is wonderful, but I just, I, I couldn't see myself there at age 29, 30, 30. 31 and be, be taking on my first job I wanted to enter the work market and I thought well I can always go back and do a PhD if I really want to at a later date but I've never given myself the chance to to go and work in, in the real world so that was that was why I wanted to do that no offense to Ohioans or to Ohio I'm sure it's gorgeous <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very very kind um, so then following from your earlier work in radio and tv where you started to make these inroads you went on to work for Ralph Applebaum, where you worked as a senior content developer and interpreter planner for large scale museum and heritage projects. Can you tell us a bit about this organization and your role? Yeah, it, it's one of the sort of hidden industries of the, of, of the museum world uh, is that when museums do big projects, which increasingly they, they have done more and more of these as museums start to appeal to wider audiences. And also there's there's larger pots of national and international funding available for those kinds of big capital projects. Mm -hmm. um, they don't ever do them, them themselves. They don't design them and develop them themselves they might have curatorial expertise that leads them but they don't um they don't they don't produce all of that stuff in yeah. in-house a lot of them don't even have the skill set to, to do a lot of that themselves so ralph applebaum associates are a company that specialize in in doing um interpretive design for um large-scale uh, museum projects and i really lucked out i had a good friend who worked there and she needs some help over the summer answering the telephones and i was available and i was keen and and I just said, yes, I'm going to go for this. And at the end of that period of six weeks, I basically stuck my ground and said, I really like this and I think I could be good at this. Uh, will, you, will you keep me on? And um, thankfully, they, they were able to do so. And then I went from basically answering the telephones to being the, 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 the main or the lead content um, developer um, for, the, for, for, for the London office in about five years. So oh. it was a bit of a roller coaster. <laughs> Do you think you, you could identify what the key skills were that you developed up to that point that sort of made you able to secure those positions? Uh, that when you, whenever you're working in consultancy, there's definitely a bit of what does your CV look like? It's a very small part, but I would say it's not, a, it's not insignificant. And I think to begin with, that was what got me in the door, the fact that my CV did have those institutions on them. So a Cambridge degree can get you places. It, it got me there. Um, I think people were quite excited by what that would look like, not, not to them personally, but what that would look like to the clients for right. whom they were selling my time and my expertise, basically. Um, and then I think it was a combination of, I had spatial awareness. I'd done a bit of, a tiny bit of curating um, in my spare time when I was an undergrad. I'd done, a, I'd done a show in my college and I'd done some art stuff. And I was, I just loved visiting museums and galleries. So I was kind of aware how space and um, objects and artworks and um, text panels and things like that could all come together to create something that was meaningful. Um, and I think the radio and television really helps as well. You get really good at distilling a story to kind of key ideas or beats as they're sometimes called. And um, you start just thinking, OK, well, that's a big, big theme. But if you come at it through this angle, instantly it unlocks all of these other other kinds of ideas. So that's very much a key skill that you need um, um, to, to, to work in the, to work in the museum environment in the exhibition side of things um, and I just I loved it it mixed everything together that I wanted it had the 3d space it had the storytelling it was multi-platform communication it was dealing with historical objects and trying to make them relevant to real people and yeah I just took to it like a duck to water it was wonderful 
really wonderful. So it sounds like it pulled together all these different strands and you were able to really develop through that role. Um, and and REA were really, really uh, generous. They, they, um, they allowed me to work on all sorts of projects in all sorts of different ways. They were incredibly um, open-minded to working on uh, really big projects and really small projects. So I really got to flex my wings in lots of ways. They, they grew me up as it were. That's really interesting. Um, and so then you, through that, you obviously developed this, uh, you know, bigger expertise. And now you're, you're working as part of the senior management team at the Railway Museum in York, where you are the head of the in interpretation and design. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the day to day of this role. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I can. Um, so it's definitely a big step to go uh, from consultant to client side. And that was definitely a big learning curve. <laughs> um, so my my day to day, uh, I think the first year look, looks quite different from my day to day now, now that I've really worked out what my priorities are and where I'm kind of quote unquote adding value the most because you do have to when you take on a more of a leadership role you have to be quite selective with where you put your time um, so I'm always trying to think well, well, where can I best be situated am, am I doing something that somebody else can do um, better than me and actually I should just step back from this and that's hard for me because I like to be in the detail <laughs> I like to know what's going on um, but no typical I mean I, I do a lot of meetings um, so we're engaged in a big project around um, a, a new master plan we're doing a big capital development which we call vision 2020 Mm -hmm. um, and so I do a lot of meetings that are about the strategy or future direction of that because there are a million decisions to take about how we design our museum from how big should our doorways be to how many interactives should we have in this gallery to um, how are we going to achieve planning permission in the right time frame so that we can meet our deadlines so a whole range of different things which I'm not directly responsible for all of those things but I'm part of the conversation so I work really closely with my senior management team colleagues um, in other disciplines and together we we try and take the right decisions that's right for for, for us as, as, as the people who operate the museum on behalf of the of the wider public but also for the visitors that we want to come through our doors. It's really interesting <clears throat> so really getting that that oversight of, the, of going on right down to the detail what, what would you say that you enjoy the most about this job? Oh um, well I think there's two things there's there's the uh, there's the colleagues that I work with I mean we have a really strong team that the museum is led by a woman for the first time in its history in its nearly 50 year history um, so I have the most fantastic boss um, and we have a really really close cohort of senior management team colleagues who we really understand each other we understand where our strengths are and we really work together so I love that and I have a fantastic team who, who um, help me deliver all the things that I need to deliver as well um, and then the other thing I think is the ambition. I think the Railway Museum has historically suffered from, I mean, it's, it's a very popular museum, don't get me wrong, it's a very popular museum. It holds a firm favourite heart of place in lots of people's hearts. Um, but I think it's suffered from perhaps looking a bit too much to the past. And what we're trying to do is balance that look to the past with a look towards what's going on right now in the rail industry and in the railways in and into the future. Because actually some of the most exciting engineering projects of the last well the last two centuries and potentially of the next century or the century we're in I suppose um, have been railway projects and um, mm -hmm. railways are as exciting as space and tech uh, for engineering but they're not perceived like that so um, I feel we've got a really strong part to play in kind of changing the perception of what railways mean to us as a, as a, as a nation as a, as a, as a people um, but also in thinking about how we can inspire people to become those engineers of the next generation. And I feel really passionately that engineering is that creative discipline that actually you can bring together so many different skills in, mm -hmm. in, in that and put it to public good. Yeah, it's really exciting. It sounds like a really exciting time and that forward look, it's, it's really, really interesting time to be there, it sounds like. I can imagine also yes. that, you know, in, you know, in this challenging, and you've talked about it being really varied in terms of the higher level management and not also I expect the financial aspects, do you still that you find that you're able to continue to be engaged in those design and maybe more curatorial elements of the work? Uh, yeah, it depends really. I tend to sort of, I tend to get most involved where it's a project which either, um, I tend to get most involved in the permanent projects, the ones which will have the greatest legacy, or potentially those that maybe have slightly higher profile as well. So we've we've recently publicly announced we have an exhibition about the Trans-Siberian Railway, which yeah. will be our first blockbuster exhibition at the National Railway Museum. We have um, a, a wonderful uh, partner that we're working with, um, who's based in Russia, and we also have um, 
a set of amazing objects that are coming, lots of them coming from Russia itself, but some of them coming from the UK as well. And I think it's, it's a really exciting project because it really captures that imagination of that mm -hmm. journey, but also we'll talk about the huge engineering feat, which uh, I believe, I don't think that's ever been spoken about in the UK and it is the world's longest railway. So we've got a fabulous story to tell ah. there as well. So I do, so I, so I'm quite involved in, in sort of the design language that we think of and sort of setting up the key messages and the key ideas. Um, and what I tend to do is kind of generate those in partnership with maybe some key senior stakeholders and colleagues and get that buy-in. And I hand it over to my team and say, okay, well, fill in the gaps, point out what I've missed, tell me, tell me where I'm going wrong. And they then feed back to me and they then get to sort of sketch out the detail and they really start to own that project for themselves and take it to great places that I could never have done on my own. So. That's really interesting. It sounds like a very dynamic kind of process, the way, the way you describe it. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So, so thinking about sort of museum and galleries more broadly, what would you say is the value of networking for people looking for roles in museums and galleries? Networking is always helpful. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, weirdly, I didn't get this job through a network. I, I knew nobody at the Science Museum Group, so National Railway Museum is part of the Science Museum Group. So I, I didn't know anybody in the museum. I'd known a little bit about its history because it had tried doing some other things. So th this job for me was purely, I applied and I got it and, it, and that's how it worked. Um, so that was fortunate. <laughs> um, but I think certainly my early career, that, that networking was really, really useful. Um, and I see it now that people um, come and talk to me and say, oh, could, could, you, could you give me two weeks work experience in the summer? And if we can accommodate it, we always will do. If we've got real things for them to be working on, then we absolutely will. Um, I think no network is ever unhelpful. Um, so I always kept my ears open and just went with, okay, well, this, this could be useful. Let's, let's just go for it. Let's follow it up. Let's have a coffee. Let's meet with somebody. Um, Cause you'll never not learn something. Um, the key thing I would say about if you are going to kind of meet somebody and have a cup of tea with them and they are, and they do give you your time. Um, and I didn't realize this until somebody did this with me and they sort of turned up and, and they had no questions to ask me. They didn't want to know anything about me and they'd done no research into me. Now no. I don't expect you to have done research into me. I'm not that sort of, uh, I don't need an ego boost, but but it's your chance to kind of mine them for their for their information. So definitely bring a couple of questions that you might want to ask them. Sounds obvious, but worth yeah, but taking full advantage of the opportunity. Really, they, you know, they will exactly. get out of it by doing it that way. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. So, so it is. I mean, that kind of that does highlight it is really such a competitive field. If you're doing any recruiting for roles in the museum. What would you say are the key skills and attributes you look for in a candidate? And then also, what are the things that really make a candidate stand out? Oh, it's it's so hard to put your finger on it. I, recently, I have just recruited a couple of roles, actually, and they were extremely competitive. Um, and I, I mean, definitely authenticity. So just sort of being, being yourself and being relaxed and being a sort of professional version of yourself in, in interview is always really helpful. So never feel like you have to put on some kind of additional persona um, in order to be it. You need to feel comfortable in the role because you're because if, you, if you're successful in it, you can't keep that persona up for sure. Um, I'm sort of always looking for um, somebody who's got the ability to um, follow something creatively and know and know how to get that to a point without too much compromise, but with the ability to compromise within it, I suppose. Right. Um, and, that, and, and that comes with, uh, I suppose, a certain amount of maturity of knowing that your ideas are not you, your, yourself. Do you know what I mean? That, that there is a difference. An idea can have an independence from you. So if I make a critique of, of, of an idea, I don't want that to be perceived as personal criticism. It's a, it's a, it's a making the idea better. So definitely that team working spirit around that is really, really, really helpful. Um, and a certain amount of resilience as well is, is, is always useful. Um, it's a word that gets used a lot, um, particularly at the moment. Um, it's yeah. something that I, I look for people who can pick up an idea and run with it, but can easily pick up something the next day and run with that as well. And they don't sort of, it, it doesn't destroy them in the process. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's a, a, a certain flexibility, Absolutely. at least at least in the roles that I'm recruiting for, that's sort of what I'm that's the kind of outcome yeah. I'm looking for. And it goes without saying, passion for the passion for the organisation that you're applying for. Yeah. And whenever you get that golden question, why do you want this role or what drew you to the role? Talk about the role. Talk about the organisation. Don't talk about yourself. <laughs> don't, don't, that will come later. That's the rest of the interview. But yeah. um, uh, my, my least favourite answer is, oh, well, it's the next step in my career. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> we're not we're here like, this, is a this is a good yeah. conversation yeah do you have a vision for what could happen in this particular role yeah exactly just kind of show that you've done a bit of research into yeah. into who we are and, and why we interest you and yeah, uh, have, have a good answer for that yeah super important advice mm. uh, and sort of uh, you've mentioned resilience and flexibility do you think anything else particular has changed in terms of key still skills as a result of covid restrictions um, I mean, the only thing that I think is different is, is, is a certain amount of ability to know how to get online and get around. But I mean, that increasingly, that's part of everyone's day job anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the more familiar you are with that, the easier it is. But it's never going to be a stumbling block. If you, <clears throat> like if, you, if you, for example, you don't have access to those sorts of things, you can't be expected to, to, to know how to use them. So it's definitely yeah. not a deal breaker, but it certainly makes things smoother and easier. Um, but we all hope very much that we will be able to return in, in yeah. some way to in-person working and, and certainly to reopening the museums. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you think, um, in terms of recruitment, do you think uh, doing a postgraduate course in museum or gallery studies is helpful? I, I have a slightly different take on this from, from many people. Um, I, because I didn't do one myself, and I considered one as well, I, I don't think it's particularly necessary and helpful. And I, I was able to volunteer and gather experiences. I, I worked at Kettle's Yard when I was at um, uh, Cambridge um, and uh, got to be their student representative, which basically meant I did a lot of flyering and sat on some committees. But it was great fun, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, but I think... Um, I think you should always do a postgraduate degree for the love of the postgraduate degree. So if your passion is museum studies, go and do a museum studies degree. But if your passion is something else, you will find relevant information in that, that then, that's then relevant to a future career. Um, I mean, the example I always give is I studied uh, the medieval cathedral um, and looking at that from a kind of multidisciplinary point of view a cathedral is a perfect metaphor for an exhibition because if you think about it it's got spaces that are made meaningful by artworks and images and sound and text that's basically what an exhibition is so there's definitely relevance if between what I studied even though it doesn't look like it on on paper um, so that's what I think yeah and being able to see that relevance yourself and understand how to, to demonstrate that connection is obviously very valuable as well but thank you that's really helpful and so just coming back a bit to covid it's obviously having a huge impact on the sector in so many ways that you know we really have yet to understand would you would you think it preferable to try other sectors first to gain transferable skills or to, or to directly pursue arts and museum sectors or is there um, just maybe carrying on with that, do you have any other advice for getting work experience as well at the moment? Uh, I think that I have certainly benefited from having multi-sector experience in my career. Um, I have really been, enjoyed the fact that I have not just worked in a museum and worked client side. I've got that corporate consultant background, which is... I mean, it was creative, highly, highly creative, but there is a bottom line to meet and that's always valuable knowledge because you still have a bottom line to meet in museums as well, but it sometimes doesn't, doesn't come up quite as, <laughs> quite as visibly. Um, and certainly the, the, the multidisciplinary work around both events and, and um, working in media really, really helped me. So it can never hurt. I think at some point one comes to a natural moment where you go, okay, is this, is, is this going to be my thing? Is this where I'm going to go? Um, and I think that comes at different times for different people um, and I heard a really inspiring story ages ago now of a woman who decided she wanted at least three or four careers in her life so every 15 years or 10 years she decided she was going to change and retrain and she stuck to it and when I met her she was she was just on the cusp between the first career and starting the second career oh, so wow. I think it you can it, it's your life you can make it what you want of it you can make yeah. these choices and make these decisions no one is holding you to anything so um, and then you asked about tips about getting work experience in the current um, yeah. uh, current scheme. It is really, really difficult because um, because the, many museums are going through um, streamlining processes and they're looking at only really business critical uh, works. Um, so. Uh, I don't have an easy answer for you on that. Um, there are places that do do digital volunteering and remote volunteering. So I think if there are organisations perhaps close to you in your local neighbourhood who might be interested in, in doing something like that, or um, you could reach out to that. I, I think the local is probably the best way to go. That would, that would be where I would go if I was looking for work experience right now, because at least there's somewhere 
that tangible that you can kind of see and visit. Um, but there are also opportunities um, further afield for digital volunteering. Um, for recently, we did something with the Science Museum um, as part of the medicine project that we did, the new medicine galleries at the Science Museum. We used volunteers to identify um, uh, bottles. Uh, they were had some sort of chemical in them and we didn't know anything about them so we worked with some volunteers who were all working remotely yeah. um, but we trained them and recruited them to identify these um <clears throat> these these bottles and they gave us a lot of valuable information so there are sort of schemes like that that you could yeah. still do whilst you were working from home yeah that's great so sort of looking for those opportunities and sort of that's a good tip thinking of local places as well um I do have one final question for you, um, and that's just if you have any particular professional blogs or particular publications that you read that that might be helpful for people listening. Yeah, um, I, I'm quite a blog reader. I love I love reading blogs, and when they took away Google Reader, I was devastated. So I, I do keep up with um, what was Nina Simon's blog. I think it's called Museums 2.0. I'm not quite uh -huh. sure, um, but it, if if you Google her, you'd find her her blog. But it's been taken over by somebody new now because Nina's moved on from the museum that she was well, moved on from that role as well. So, um, but it, that's always a useful source of thought provoking information. Um, there are some quite good um, uh, museum related podcasts as well i think there's one called the wonder house which i really enjoy listening to um i i do read some professional things like museums association and that sort of stuff um, which I, I really enjoy for kind of sector news but actually some of the things a lot of the stuff i do it as i try and read outside of the sector and to bring in new ideas so i read i read design the design um website um i also really enjoy story the story things newsletter which comes out every friday and has got nice little links to kind of content and storytelling tips, which I really enjoy. Uh, brain pickings I really like nice. as well as a website. <laughs> That's really good. Um, yeah. And then I, I've also recently subscribed to, I'm just looking at my notes, um, the newsletters of both Helen Lewis and Caroline Criado Perez, uh, who wrote Invisible Women. And Helen Lewis has written a book about, I think it's the history of feminism in 12 fights. Um, oh, and both of them are witty, clever, uh, women journalists and writers and their newsletters are always full of things that I never expect um, and things that I would never have found on the internet um, that probably a bit more general interest but um, but I really enjoy reading I often find ideas in those in those other areas that then come to inform my work whether it's through business decisions or team leadership or even creative things ways to get to a creative consensus um, yeah. that you might not have thought about. No, thank you. That's that actually is really, really helpful tips. And I look forward to exploring some of those as well. Um, and just to just to round things off really by saying a huge thanks. That was, you know, you talked about somebody else being very inspiring, but I, you, you, that was really inspiring to hear and really, you know, thanks so much for giving us your time and for engaging us in this way. It was very generous. Um, with your insights and all your advice that you've developed through your career and this I think you should know this is really going to be very valuable for students working to chart their path in this sector and you know you've really taken the time to show us what that landscape can look like so huge thanks for being so inspiring and engaging and for sharing your time <laughs> well thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and um, I'm here to here to help and talk I, I was saying before we got on the recording that so many people gave me a leg up and a step up that it's um, I feel like it's the least I can do to share these things as well so um, good luck to everybody <laughs> how that work is ever unhelpful I've written that down <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much